Now we are going to receive the keynote address from Reverend Father Gerard Jumba, Nyukomo, who is a Catholic priest. He has a PhD in Sacred Theology from the Lateran University of Rome, a specialist on John Henry Newman's theological and educational talk. He is currently professor of theology at the St. Thomas Aquinas Pontifical University, Angelico, Rome. He is visiting professor on African theological realities at the Jesuit University in India. He has published six books, and amongst these is one on Dr. Fonlon, Why Ben and Fonlon Matters, The Holiness of an Embattled African. Please, let us listen keenly on this great scholar of Ben and Fonlon. Father, we are okay. God. Bernard Fonlon, a man for all, all times. Bernard Fonlon, a man for all times. I begin this address with a quotation from Bernard Sokika Fonlon in his uh, The Genuine Intellectual, which will act as a guiding light to all that we will be discussing. And we are getting ages away from President Lincoln who sat down to write his historic letter to a mother who had lost five sons in the Civil War. This war this told war. on him, wore him down because he felt for men. No man hardly counts anymore, but to the true intellectual, he should count before all else, should be his prime occupation, yes, Man, first and last, should be the foremost concern of the genuine intellectual. Dear brothers and sisters, for many years, in fact, since infancy, I have had a hero, the subject of this keynote address, the subject of this conference, Bernard Nsaokeka von Lund. I make no apology for being a hero worshiper. If, as the British philosopher Carlyle said, If, as the British philosopher Carlyle said, the worship of a hero is transcendent admiration of a great man. I say that I live by admiration, wonder, anticipation, and contemplation. And Dr. Bernard Sokika von Lund has always excited in me those sentiments towards himself. Vincent Jumba, my father, his intimate intellectual connection with Fonlon that introduced me to Bernard at a so tender age transformed me into a worshiper at the oracle of his philosophy, at the shrine of his literature, and at the altar of his integrity. This done through paging his soul-stirring books and speculator specular life that electrifies, astonishes, and ennobles. If I were alone in the statement, which I am not, I would say without hesitation that Dr. Bernard Fonlon is the 20th century's greatest African educationist whose pedagogy should be included in the curriculum of all higher educational institutions in the whole of this continent. Bernard Fonlon, there is so much to contemplate about you and much too much to behold. The trouble is that your life denies quarantining but welcomes pondering instead. Like many here, I thought I knew you. Now I realize that when I am in your company, it is myself I experience 
That is the marvelous marriage we have in knowing you and in enjoying your craft and in having friendship with you. We watch with a new wonder each time we fraternize with you. This because you are us. With you, my season is always Easter. You showed us the moral and intellectual way. You gave us tools of language and learning, things which we use today for God's glory. You helped me right from infancy to see the world in its people, in their genuineness. 30 years after, I see the man you are because things are exactly as you told me. You made the English language honest in our eyes and reshaped it until it become and became a tool in our hands for our liberation. When we assemble here as we have to pay homage, ladies and gentlemen, to one of our own who distinguished himself so eminently among the greats in the intellectual enterprise in the continent of Africa, it should be a significant event, not only for us who know him, but for all who cherish the values by which he was inspired. Fonlon stood for the life of the spirit against the forces that would debase human dignity and human destiny. His example today is needed more than even yesterday. As a philosopher, his quest for truth was unquenchable. As an educationist, his work on human formation indicated the way to Africa that there was somewhere, somehow, the African culture worthy of preservation. We of the African race cannot remind ourselves too often of what the black man has gone through and of the condition in which he finds himself today, consequent on centuries of tribulation, Bernard told us. He was despoiled of all he had, despoiled of his rights, despoiled of his mind, despoiled of the will to resist. He was degraded, reduced to the level of the beast. In the words of a celebrated oratorium, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Africa, African people, have found their personal lives thrilled and empowered by the significance Dr. Fonlon attached to his identity and place in human history. Those who seek the unseen world in what seems like an atheistic age find in him a strengthening booster who championed African saintliness in the Christian religion. Bernard Fonlon, saint and scholar. Maybe the simplest tribute suits him best. He was a simple man. Even in politics, in simplicity and self-effacement, Fonlon was the arrowhead and master strategist of the pioneer government of reunited Cameroon who called the shots from the background. Dr. Bernard Fonlon believed strongly that, and I quote him, any genuine thinker scholar shrinks back with horror from adulation as from the plague, runs away from the fans as from a madding crowd, fulsome praise, the blaze of publicity, exciting and harmless as they may look, can do untold even irreparable harm to the upcoming intellectual. Human beings fall, fall in love with simplicity, the finest way to make life simple for those around you is to humanize, to care, to be the perfect tonic to others, to make them feel respected and appreciated. The best way to be simple is to speak with the human voice, to bring people close to nature and to grace. Bernard Fallon teaches us that every end is a human being. His philosophical success, driven by the vision of the genuine intellectual, is to refine ideas to their bottom line, simple, thorough. 
ideas are the most powerful things in the world, the most necessary and the most precious too. Bernard said, for any human achievement, however immense, however spectacular, however spellbinding, must inevitably take birth as an imponderable concept in a human mind. Consequently, thinking is the most necessary, the most noble activity of man. Indeed, it is unquestionably thanks to ceaseless thought that the world grows and develops and reshapes itself. Therefore, those in power who strive to suppress thought, whatever degree, for whatever reason, however seemingly plausible, may be depriving the world of untold benefits. Their thoughts can do irreparable harm and render themselves guilty beyond pardon of a heinous crime against humanity. Yes, it has happened before. Our concern is that nowhere on this earth should it ever happen again. Clarity propels Bernard von Lund. Not classical clarity, but penetrating across the board, 24 hour clarity. And know this, the garbage masterpieces that fill libraries are rampant in the intellectual world. Well mentioned, organized thesis, but often with clothed style and language that jars the mind. Bernard von Lund was an honest writer. Open communication, which often lacked the cutting irony of his mental and moral mentor, John Henry Newman. The finest advice he left humanity be true to fellow humans. His life teaches us the pleasure of simple living. He infects us with his enthusiasm for plunging into the deep rivers of an examined life worth living then takes us down some beautiful cliffs of salutary but frightening risks that lift hearts up. They undervalue the value of simplicity today. But Fonlon, even when he was conscious of it, that he was a great man, brought himself down to the level of the unlettered. He believed the universe was a totality of material and non-material bodies the embodied and the unembodied world. At this point, the question arises, Fondon said, whether beyond quantity, beyond matter, anything else exists. There is a phalanx of learned and prestigious philosophers who say no. For my part though, without learning and prestige, I say yes, I'm saying so with me are the millions who believe in the existence of non-material human soul in the existence of a spirit world, in the existence of God. Besides the visible, sensible world, there exists another beyond the reach and ken of eye and ear and smell and touch and taste. Above all, Bernard von Lund had a clear-cut self-evident sense of God a consciousness of a creator who created man and the world, a God who leads him through his dark and bright days. But this sharp sense of God was equaled by his greatness of mind, which was bold and brought itself to bear on questions of faith. Bernard Fonlon is one of the great luminaries of our time. His inner strength may well have come from knowledge and wisdom, but it is it is his religious conviction that gave him sustenance and spiritual power. Fonlon believed that faith was the soul of social union. The idea of progress without religion strikes Fonlon as so outrageously nonsensical that it inspires the first really extended display of his literary production, as I see it. The man, he says, who rejects God rejects the only hope of man. Religion, therefore, is a thing which no man or nation can afford to trifle with. From first to last, education in the large sense of the word was Bernard von Lund's line. Bernard von Lund's total being 
was so gobbled up by learning that in 1975, he resigns the flourishing public life of Manning Ministries as minister, embracing the classroom in university education. Education, real education is achieved not by transforming institutions, but by the torch of person to person, the master to the student. Education is the heart of man, stirred by impressions gained from being in contact with an inspiring master, a teacher who describes using poetic feeling, who influences young people by the power of his sentiments of his voice, who inflames the young with simple penetrating deeds, and whose facts and events in school the students remember all through their lives. Education to him occurs not so much in academic classrooms, research labs, and book rooms. It resides also in the busy intellectual marketplace, in the church pulpit, in creative writing, in sports centers, in music making, in journalism, in literature, in philosophical debate, for in the weighty words of his other contemporary, Chino Achebe, to be educated is, after all, to develop the questioning habit, to be skeptical, to be skeptical of easy promises and to use past experience creatively. The Aboriginal target of education, especially higher education, is not the gaining of advantageous information or acquisition of talents vital for specific callings in life. It is the gardening and enlarging of the brain. That is the teaching of the mind to think freely, fruitfully, and fearlessly. The essence and integrity of education is to build civilization to give life to human beings, to bring peace and justice in the hearts of men and women, and to make them happy beings. And therefore, it is not about half-baked education, but about its fully flourishing, about bringing the destinies of our people to full bloom. For in the words of Bernard von Lohn, if the intellectual is to be unflinchingly faithful to his role, that is, to be the untiring seeker of the truth, the good, the right, and the beautiful, and the don't let defend our against falsehood, evil, injustice, and philistinism, if he is to be the principled non-conformist, or as I have baptized him, the God fly and God, risking the frown of the great and tyrant stroke, he must acquire a will of granite, must possess or cultivate a more than normal caliber of courage. Indeed, without fearlessness, without the readiness to die, to lose all if need be. No thinker scholar, however high his talent, can ever make an impact on his community. The recognition, right from Inugu seminary days, that Christianity was a learned religion, filled for Lon's entire life with immense delight. Christianity came to the world as the child of an institution of the scholarly elders. At the age of 12, Jesus Christ is already seen flexing intellectual muscles with the doctors of the law in the temple. And to speak with divine authority was to quote the Psalms and the prophets. To speak for God, you had to be acquainted with the writings of the ancients, the Torah. This Jesus did, this Paul did, and the Bible as it is served today comes to us thanks to the great scholarship of Matthew, of John, and later of Mark and Luke. So the philosopher in church speculates and the theologian submits to his learning. So it was for lost joy to be part of that religion that never despised Plato, that embraced, I will say, hook, sink, liner, the Aristotelian metaphors of philosophy in the great saint and scholar Thomas Aquinas. Bernard von Long directed the attention of the rising generation 
to higher and more primitive ways of Christian truth and morality than had literally been in esteem among us. He was what is called seeing the world, entering into active life, going into society, traveling, acquaintance with the various classes of the community, coming into contact with the principles and moods of thought of separate parties, interests or nations, their opinions, views, aims, habits and manners, their religious creeds and forms of worship. All this exerts a perceptible effect upon the mind, which it is impossible to mistake, be it good or be it bad, and which is popularly called its enlargement or enlightenment. Bernard von Lund's pedagogical philosophy for the embattled African continent is encapsulated in the last advice which a King David, dying, gave to his son Solomon. Esther Vir, be a man. The African tendency to give primacy to human, social, moral, and spiritual considerations, Bernard says, as opposed to calculations of material gain or advantage, should be encouraged and reinforced. The straightforward candor, the simplicity and the naturalness of the African's attitude towards his fellow men is to be preferred to the artificiality, the excessive cultivation, the sophistication, and the overfineness of European manners. The African conviction that the inculcation of manliness is a first principle of education should be restored and stressed in the face of the emasculating effects of pleasure-loving Western materialism. The idea of a university as an institution of unique, special, and original purpose has all but disappeared. Universities today more and more operate as performance-oriented, massively bureaucratic organizations, entire economic bastions, and institutions impregnated with mediocre philosophies of human excellence. Just as Fonlon battled against the ethical anathemas, that is, the damaging moral trends within education that were destroying a country they had so much hope in, and which, alas, ended up a disappointment, we must today fight in our own times against the lack of direction and loss of vision of the modern university. Bernard von Lund had what John Henry Newman in the idea of a university called an imperial intellect, a mind with a devouring appetite, able to take in and digest gigantic intellectual menu. Bernard von Lund captured the spirit of the times in his deathless masterpiece, The Genuine Intellectual, undeniably the single most important treatise in English language on the nature and meaning of higher education in Africa. Fonlon was hypnotized by literature, education, music, politics. He was fascinated by ethics, science, philosophy, theology, that is, that intellectualism that tends to lift men away from the crude, brute world into the high ethereal heavens of lofty, absolute principles. His intellect was not merely a library of captivating facts and factoids, but a colossal monument decked with a beautiful intellectual panorama in which stones and cement and roof and ceiling and floor were absolutely arranged in relevant locations, harmonized with an erudite, careful, scholarly perspicacity and an intentional grace for an awe-inspiring edifice. An intellectual is not drawn to dogmatically fixed ideologies, fixed on some naive cultural views that ignores the genuine aspirations and cries of suffering and subjugated people. For instance, the matter of the Cameroons, or more pertinently, perhaps the matter with the Cameroons, the Southern Cameroons and the Republic of Cameroon today must be the subject of the hour. 
Dr. Bernard Fallon taught us never to be afraid of thirsting for the truth and never to settle for mediocrity, to live with open hearts and minds and not just stick with prevailing mentality in a world that celebrates deceit and counterfeit living. The questions of our people, their suffering, their battles, their dreams, their trials, their worries possess an interpretational value that we cannot ignore if we want to take the principle of the incarnation seriously. Their wondering helps us to wonder ourselves. Their questions question us. Now, I come to the Southern Cameroon's reality, a one which, if we are to be honest, must be animated by a philosopher, by a theologian, an educationist that brings hope to a people targeted by war, a territory that has gone through an oppression, a colonial oppression that must be decolonized now. Unless we stretch the topic of our conference, which is about the relevance of Fonlon to us, unless we stretch it to breaking point, this keynote address will be about some other thing and not Bernard Fonlon. Often the phrase, though well-meaning, asks for the wider Cameroon Republic's community to ensure that the so-called Anglophones feel welcome in their country. I say I don't need to be welcomed by anyone. I was born at Kumbo, Chisholm Hospital, to parents whose ancestors owned that land. My journey through my mother's womb to the cradle of Kumbo was pretty enough to welcome me in my land of birth. The midwives and reverend sisters who caught the baby me made me feel at home. My most essential intellectual formation, right till priesthood, was all in that native land of ours. So when I say I am of the Southern Cameroons, the world must listen. Though some couple of years now here in Rome, nothing shakes the foundations that my Aboriginal native land laid for me. So I am a proud native of the Southern Cameroons. We want to confer on this man, Dr. Bernard Fonlon, the title of upholder of the mantle of the Southern Cameroon's values. This because he is the first ever prophet of what was going to happen to the people of the, sta of the state of the Southern Cameroons, the oppression, the annexation, the wicked military occupation. The history of the world is the history of few biographies. The history of the unholy reunification of the Cameroons in 1961 up to 1984 outright annihilation of the Southern Cameroons to La Republic of Cameroon. This history is the biography of Bernard Fallon. The past, the pangs, the trials are his. Saint and scholar, consistent in living the standards of a noble life. His life is a metaphor for the Southern Cameroon's agony today. When Bernard and Sokeka Fallon began his literary career with the book, as I see it, he joined a long and venerable line of intellectuals who cared about conscience of scholars who sought to move society, not merely by saying what was, but by reinventing their own world and generating an atmosphere that spoke to the realities of the concrete lives of their people. The most meaningful manner and intellectual of the Cameroons of today can dissect a topic of public importance, therefore, and be relevant to his stricken community, is to interrogate not only the normal two sides of the question, but also to put the screws to his own personal conscience and have the courage to speak more, not from schools of thought about the question, but to address the subject matter from conscience, to look into the disputed point as he sees it. Bernard Fonlon's first book is entitled, As I See It. A young seminarian penetrating already into issues as he sees it, not as society sees it, not as others see it, not even merely as the church sees it, but as I see it. A bold moral statement from someone who wants to do him 
to think him, to think for himself, and to solve problems taking his personal experience into account. Because if he, if I see it well, then the universe sees it well. The church sees it well. God sees it well. This, because truth is one, that is moral courage. The fearlessness to go out there and do the right thing. For according to Dr. Bernard Fernand himself, he said, the law of fearlessness forbids me to tremble before any man or group of men. It forbids me to shrink back from doing what such examination has shown me to be true, good, worthy, and noble. It commands me to do that good, to do it fully prepared to embrace harrowing criticism, bitter unpopularity, crushing punishment, sharper censure, dismal failure. Yet, this is a law enjoining enlightened firmness, not blind obstinacy. Ladies and gentlemen, before 1957, the predominant conditioning to the world by colonialists was that Africans were so unfit to rule themselves that they could not be allowed to, the, to themselves in matters political. It took Kwame Nkrumah from proud studies in America to see that such nonsense should not be allowed space anymore. And he marshaled the energies of his people and they won independence in 1957. Ghana was the pilot state for sovereign rule among Africans. Today, the Southern Cameroonian stands in that vantage pilot position for the unfree zones of the African continent, continent refused liberty. The overpowering relevance of this role cannot be overstressed. But if this historical feat must be made, made not mad, the intellectual body of the Southern Cameroons must get in, must engage. The Southern Cameroon intellectual must be the term into which the African traditionalists, the unlettered masses, should be grafted so that the sap that runs through the revolutionary organism from the root to the flower and give life and strength to our national cause should be guided by solid principles, top scholarly investigation and stoic discipline. If this is to happen, the Southern Cameroonian scholar must engage in the study of past salutary revolutions of, for example, American and the Cuban type must get to who George Washington was, must delve into the study of what Ernest Che Guevara offered the world, must study anew the things that made Mao Zedong to build a China that is respected today by the whole world, must get into the mind of Desmond Tutu and make Saint Oscar Romero his patron saint. Any university in the Southern Cameroons, however glorified, however high sounding, that does not help its freshmen to think and look for solutions to the brewing war of independence that the manhood of our land is bravely committed to today can in no way be of relevance to our embattled people. For those who have locked Fonlon in a federal box and therefore dictate to the Fonlon of their own make belief to follow a paltry stance of wedding with the parasites of our people, we tell them to read history and inform themselves on who the real Fonlon is. Bernard had expressed in his Will We Make Omar, right back in 1964, the weaknesses even of the national federal system that was born in Fumban. He indicates that, and I quote, the result of this many-sided inequality is that in this federation, that initiative of which I spoke about, that power to introduce policy, to shape the course of events and things political, economic, social, and cultural, lies to all extents and purposes entirely in the hands of the Eastern Cameroonians. For Fonlon continues, for at the conference table, Southern Cameroons could not speak with that dignity, that authority, that is the prerogative today of even tiny Zanzibar. Ladies and gentlemen, 
it is impossible to investigate and study at all seriously in any area of the early 1960s, reunited and federal Cameroon, without sooner or later meeting the melting magic of the words Bernard Zokeka for none. The Cameroonian reunification, properly so called, is almost a phenomenon of the 1950s. It received its first charter of legitimacy in the hearts of the Students' Union of Cameroon abroad. In many respects, as events have shown, Bernard von Lund was one of his greatest architects since his overseas years. He prepared for it, tirelessly worked for it when it came. Yet, his colleagues abroad did not seem to see what the common man in the Southern Cameroons was conscious of already. They even seemed not to have had a well-grounded strategy for reunification, much as they desired that objective. It seems fair to say that they felt unable to work out something on how this goal could come to pass. Wisdom often comes from unexpected areas. It is important to listen to a discussion Bernard von Lund registered in his book To Every Son of Son, a debate he had with his mother on the outcome of the 1961 plebiscite. Her mom, like a majority of the so electorate, was for the camp of remaining in Nigeria, while Fonon was for reunification with the Republic of Cameroon. The green card, which Fonon's mother calls black, represents Nigeria. I begin the conversation now between Fonon and his mother. Ma, tell me, in which box did you put your paper? In the black box. Then so don't have a word for green. Who fooled you to do that kind of thing, Ma? Did you know Pa Jacob Lingon? The mother said. Yes, I did, said Von Lund. Do you know what they did to him? No, I don't, I don't. Then the mother says, they cut him up limb by limb and sliced him into pieces. Now tell me, how could you expect me to vote to join people who do that, that, that kind of thing? Bernard Fonlon ends with this statement. I couldn't answer back. What could you say to this? Wisdom often really comes from expected areas. Right back in 1961, through the story of Pa Jacob Lingon, von Lund's mother prophesied already what was awaiting us. The Pa Jacob Lingon of today are children, the five-year-old Caroline Diale Inongene, and just last week, the eight-year-old Tato Brandy is the butchery our people are undergoing today in the hands of the mafia military occupation our people are subjected to. The pain and affliction of our people talked about here, and which is certainly not taken, taken lightly by genuine Southern Cameroonian intellectuals, is how a brother has stood for 60 years before God, as Cain was, confounded by a question that he merely cannot wish away at the wave of an indecent, domineering, and iron-handed one. The big biblical question, where is your brother Cain? Ahijo, where is your phone chat? The question itself, which has lost steam today among the enough and enough generation. But the walls of Bernard von Lund's conviction on a united Cameroon cracked completely in 1975, when after a long service of his people as minister in three ministries, he could not bear the hypocrisy and could not do service under the big lie the 1972 thieving referendum provided for the Southern Cameroonian. What he saw as ignoble in Estimona's betrayal, he refused to be part of that treachery. He resigned in frustration, but with dignity from the government and took on the teaching ministry. He fell in love again with the classroom, but the coup d'etat in 1984, that all close collaborators of the former president were suspected and intimidated confirmed to Bernard von Lund that all was gone. Von Lund was Ahijo's close collaborator 
and surely feared for his life too. And therefore, all through that, that time, not too far from the year he will die, he was surveyed, suspected, and isolated, despite his harmlessness and voicelessness. In a country that he served so maximally, he was rejected and dumped into the beam. How could a man who did the stunning translation of the national anthem to English and also the anthem's second verse, how could a man who was the secretary at the office of the Prime Minister John Gufoncha, a man who served as chargé de mission at the presidency of La République du Cameroun, a man who was member of the Cameroon Federal Parliament, a deputy in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a man who was the Minister of Transport, Minister of Post and Telecommunications, and finally Minister of Public Health. How could such a man be so disregarded by the country he served so faithfully as not to be honored with a state's burial? This because before he died, Bernard von Lund at least morally had turned away from all that was La République du Cameroon. Even right back in 1982, he already had personal intimate fears of what he was beginning to believe about Cameroon and the events around him. No one would understand him except his friend of friends, Victor Anomangu. My dear Victor, Bernard von Lund intimated in deep contemplation. My dear Victor, God knows the sorrows into which he plunged me and out of which he got me in his appointed time because I have struggled struggle to have to save myself nobody knows the troubles i see as for you victor i pray god shall prosper through you what he has begun to some i am a trump a vagabond a clochard a beggar but to you i will remain a friend even if i end up in the gutter your brother ben the life of bernard von Lund is a metaphor for the once hopeful union that failed and like a poor miserable aeroplane has crashed so miserably and dangerously that all, I mean everything, is in ruins. It is all gone. The judgment of the present Southern Cameroon's debacle by the aboriginal wisdom of our people are the last words Bernard von Lund's will we make a man and they tell us where the prophet von Lund stood. I quote the words of Bernard von Lund. In this far-reaching affair, we have it full in our part to make. But should we choose instead to mar, we will be guilty of irresponsibility grave in the extreme. For perhaps we might never again be given the chance to mend. End of quote. Bernard von Lund was a prophet. Everything has been marred and damaged beyond mending. I have made this point in my writings, in public gatherings of a cultural and a historical type, in relation to the progress of the Southern Cameroonian civilization. We should endeavor to steer clear of narrow-mouthed debates that cage us fiercely into a hole where we are trapped by the eccentricities and narrow-mindedness of their despicable things and cages. The intellectual enterprise, when practiced along these lines, relocates our highest intimate sensitivities to undiscovered territories that allow us to lay eyes on the marvelous world of other peoples, felling barriers of cultural interconnectedness, thus becoming what Newman calls in his idea of the university, an imperial mind, and what his apostle, Bernard Sofika von Lund, baptizes a genuine intellectual. We, the learned class, we, the scholars of our people, we must tread carefully. We were supposed to constitute the brain and the nerve center, the heart and the blood vessel of this revolution. But alas, yet to Bernard von Lund, and I quote, a country's university, especially where there is only one, is the brains of the nation, the powerhouse of its intellectual life, the supplier of its skills, the molder of its leadership, the seat of its culture, a country's university, therefore, is its highest cultural institution. An earnest examination of conscience in those areas where, because of the wages we have to collect from slave masters, 
because of the flesh pots we have to lick in, the, in their camps, because of the blood, the boot licking psychophancy that must go on despite the suffering of our people. A serious examination of conscience uh, in those areas we have with traditional rulers openly betrayed our people's trust must quicken our resolve for a complete conversion of heart, a quick U-turn in response to public displeasure and not settle for an easy life. Instead, the poor masses, the hoi polloi of the Southern Cameroons have brought significant influence to bear on the independence progress. They have refused to be passive onlookers in affairs touching the intimacy of their destinies. The authority to kick off change, the cultural courage to suggest a new way, the power to provoke a transformation has been almost utterly in the hands of the unlettered masses and has been dormant among the intellectual and elite community of our people. Faced with the unprecedented accomplishments of the strength of the unlettered freedom fighter, it is essential to inquire where they pick up their penetrating principles, their telling tenacity, their intrepid pragmatism. To me, a university of a people must, especially in an epochal moment like this, be a mirror of the nature that our Southern Cameroon state is going. The high purpose of our people have set for themselves the noble mission that has fallen on their lot of freedom fighters must be facilitated by the brilliance of brains, the vitality of influence, and the courage of scholarly authority the Southern Cameroons is endowed with. Bernard Fonlon was a holy man. He was a saint. Many testimonies have been to this part, but I think one of them gathers the greatest weight because of the historical moment it was made and because it came from the lips of the then Bishop of Fonlon. He was a saintly man, Bishop Cornelius Esau said, and, and, account, and on account of this, regardless of who he was, I have decided to lay his mortal remains next to those of his closest friend, late Father Aloysius Wankui, as a sign of our gratitude for his affection and deep attachment to the church. A saint, dear ladies and gentlemen, is not a magician a mere miracle worker, or a man who floats about on clouds of holiness. A saint is someone who has, by God's grace, become all that they were created to be. If Fonlon is to be a saint, we must not compare him with any other saint, but we must only ask the question of whether he became what he was created to be. Bernard Fonlon was a thorough Christian, to the high level that one of his contemporaries, Dr. Verkejika Fanso, whose weighty words carry the sentiments of millions of people praying to see Bernard von Long canonized on the high altars of St. Peter's Basilica, Rome. Verkejika Fanso says, may our prayer help quicken the process of proclaiming him blessed, saint, worthy of public and universal religious honor. The Christian is a man of the past, the present, and the future. Lives in this world, but man of the unseen world. He makes the unknown world known, creates metaphors of today's happenings, the absent world, and the world in doubt. He renders alive what he accepts but does not see. The church relies not on human law, civil status, it, it relies on the proper powers of the church, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the thirsters for justice, the peacemakers, the persecuted, the merciful, the mourners, the meek. Today, dear brothers and sisters, philosophy, education, theology wants to take its ancient taste, a faith born in dialogue, in debate, in contact with other cultures, communities, countries, a faith that is ready and open to surprises. African pedagogy, African philosophy, African theology has run the risk of remaining an ideology and often a Western ideology. 
it pains to see how due to the chicken heartedness of thinking in our continent, we still are caught up into this bondage web of recounting the tenses of European heroes and singing praises of their exploits and greatness when we have giants of all time spread every here and there in the continent. Thus, we lack the time to ponder over our realities, over our challenges, over our existence. The philosopher, the pedagogue, and the theologian is first a son of his people. He begins and ends in his people's joys and tribulations. He knows his people, their language, their history, and their traditions. He sees God in the eyes of his culture and customary creed. That is why I say that though he did not have any serious theological degree, Bernard von Lund is theologian par excellence. For the, Pope's, for, for the Pope Francis's era, has made us understand that theologians are first people of faith before being thinkers and scholars. For many moral institutions, politics represents a dirty game, but not for the Pope Francis. For those who claim that religion and politics should be kept absolutely apart, contemporary church thinking reminds them that Jesus Christ was eliminated by the secular and religious authorities of his time because they saw him as a threat to civil order. For Pope Francis, therefore, moral vision, especially in his Fratelli Tutti, the litmus test of an authentic Christian relevance in society is commitment to the people's political life. A politics that is animated by charity, politics that serves the common good, politics that provides a dignified life for all citizens, a politics that eliminates social conditions that cause suffering, a politics that stands for the preferential option for the poor, and politics that confronts head on anything that threatens or violates the fundamental human rights. If we go by Mongo Betty's description of the Ahijo era, it was a barbaric age of political tyranny that in Mongo Betty's Mount Baz, Sulu Cameroon, Ahijo shamelessly walking under the tutelage of French military op operations, haunted French Cameroon's freedom fighters to their graves raised villages and napalmed populations of people in his, own, in his own Cameroon. That Bernard worked so faithfully and so charismatically under this tyrant to Dr. Bate Bisson, it was a thing to question and unsparingly put Fonlon where he belonged. But later, the young Bate Bisson will in his old ripe age come across the writings of Albert Womamokong on Bernard Fonlon to understand that one could walk under a tyrant, but still be ethically correct and spiritually unstained. The thought of what Ahijo's Manenguba Mokolo Cholire concentration camps did to prisoners without crime can leave us sympathizing with Bate Bisson's worry about uh, the political soul of Bernard von Lund if he really worked with Ahijo to that extent that he was one of the trusted ones of Ahijo. But we can seek consolation from the very words of Dr. Bate Bisson that, and I quote, Professor Bernard Sokeka Fonlon, a man who was so exceptionally handsome, was an intellectual pillar of fire, a Prometheus among his peers, indeed something of a 20th century Aristotle. Professor Fonlon, using his towering superhuman intellect, fulfilled the noble revolutionary role of critical activity in the identification and exposition of truth for the good of the Cameroonian humanity. And that he reigns from public political life when Ahijo was still, and that he resigned from public political life when Ahijo was still president is an added mark of the greatness of a man who could not be corrupted even by the iron-handed Ahijo. Bernard von Lund lived the virtue of ethical prudence in the most marvelous way, that he worked under the political regime of, of regime of what one of his scholarly compatriots, Bate Bisson, baptized the Gestapo regime of Amadou Ahijo, is indicative of a man whose moral prudence was unearthly. Ladies and gentlemen, in spite of the great exploits of Pan-Africanists to speak about this great continent of ours, we still have so much to do in the field of promoting our own and telling the world about our giants. Theology, 
of the people, pedagogy of the people, philosophy of the people is the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. It must conquer territory in the battle against the scholastic jargon that in the passing of years metamorphosed into an elite theology, an elite philosophy, an elite pedagogy, serving imperialists and colonialists at the detriment of self-determination and sovereignty of the peoples of our continent, the people of Asia and the people of Latin America. Today, an educationist can comfortably do theology if he neatly applies his field of study to the convictions of faith he holds as a genuine baptized. Bernard Follon did that in the open letter to the bishops of Bamenda and in the, as I say it, in an age in which the Pope has taken the name of the poorest man on earth, Francis of Assisi, who never was a priest, we must go back to the early church in that era where Christian faith was not disturbed by the squalid clericalism we have witnessed in recent times. The thinker scholar must get to the people. Such an one becomes what Bernard von Lund baptized a seer and which I call the prophet of the people. If the thinker scholar is verily a seer, von Lund says, one of the foremost things on which he will inescapably relentlessly have to focus the searching light of his eye and mind will be on the nature of justice and injustice. He must become inevitably the keeper of public conscience, a humble virtue of truth, goodness and justice. And I'd like to underscore the primacy of justice here among us, the intellectuals of the Southern Cameroons. For as I have said before, the puny presence of formidable intellectuals in the invigorating revolution our people have taken up is self-evident, unfortunately, and the tide is turning thunderously against us. And let history not repeat itself. For as you know, one of the greatest perplexities in modern history is how the country of people who produced Immanuel Kant, George William Hegel, Wolfgang Goethe, and Joseph Ratzinger could go down the dishonorable path of slaughtering six million Jews and other millions of other so-called inferior, inferior races. How shall we, the educated class of our times in the Southern Cameroons, testify to our great grandchildren that we did it differently and most honorably, that there was a genocide of the enormity we have, the savage slaughter, like so much beef of our own, and we sharpened our pens, stood on conference pack platforms, took into social media, gathered all scholarly forces possible, and sparkled with splendor in defending our palace people against the maneuvers and monstrosities of the barbarian and his occupying army. Oh, Bernard von Lund, in a certain sense, an accomplishment like the life of Bernard von Lund has no successor. There are some qualities which are unique and belong to a particular epoch and only to that epoch, neither passed on nor handed down. Bernard von Lund could not form a Bernard von Lund society any more than Shakespeare could teach Othello today. A dogma, an idea, a discovery, a modus operandi could be passed on or handed down. But how should a spirit like Bernard von Lund be manifested? Who shall give to others that epic simplicity, that speedy penetration into the ambiguities of an argument, that spurs perception into peculiar problems which cannot be fixed by general rules and which distinguishes Don Dr. Bernard von Lund? Who could be the moral catalyst so bold, so smart, so engaging as did Bernard von Lund in the ethical Philistinism that was and is still the Cameroons. These gifts are personal and peculiar. The masterpiece of von Lund's life and writings ought to be saluted with profound respect, published separately in track form and scattered over not only the African continent, but the whole world. We congratulate the coordinators of this venture, this conference. They have erected a monumentum ore perennius, which will ever be an honor 
in which will be in the heavens bless such architects of an intellectual enterprise like this today. We look for immediate and direct results from Bernard von Lohn's influence. We look for remote and far-reaching results. He makes himself felt in contemporary Africa and the world and in the thinking and actions of generations yet unborn. Oh, Bernard von Lohn, this remarkable church thinker, this fascinating of ardent African writers, this most moving and eye-opening apostle and philosopher, do us this favor of growing more in virtue like you, man of gigantic mind, steadfast heart, fearless seeker of the truth. Think of every one of us here according to our wants and needs. You have carried your big brain to God's paradise, but given us something of it, in your devotees, your apostles. Intercede for us, Ben, with the Most High. Put the cause of the liberation of our land, the Southern Cameroons, before the great throne of our loving God. May your name, Nso Okeka Fonlon, resonate across the continent, and your example be for the African child, a great tower of strength, a formidable pillar of integrity, and a mighty light that sparkles the world. Thank you. The first thing we have to be conscious of is the fact that uh, the world also has changed. And uh, a good number of things have changed, but we must not change completely with the world. The idea of a university in the mind of Bernard Fallon in, in the genuine intellectual was the formation of the cultivation of minds to think. And Bernard Fernand believed that you could even be a scientist, but you could write a literary work. Bernard himself did education and philosophy, but he was minister of health, of public health. And when he was minister of public health, he did it with a certain dignity and a certain uh, greatness that those who were even qualified in paper could not do. So there is a philosophical way of approaching things, which the burden should be on those who are passing the knowledge from the rector to the professors, not just from the rector to the professors, the proprietors of the various universities. It begins from there. If you are creating a university just to produce money, to bring people, so they can pay and then it rains. That is no, that is, that is a glorified secondary school. A university is there to bless young people with an environment with charismatic professors who teach by example, charismatic professors whose actions, their voices, what John Henry Newman calls influence, helps to garner a certain atmosphere that brings the students to the realization of the destinies that they are living. I give an example. When a good professor teaches in a university, his presence in a university, when students leave that university, they are not thinking about the theses that they wrote with that professor. They are not thinking about the notes that professor gave them. They, are rem they will be remembering but the words of that professor, how he made them feel, how when he came to class, there was a certain silence, reverence, because students were expecting something, not from this world, but an ethereal uh, atmosphere, which created certain ideas that the students were